Hello loved ones, Paisley Parvati Devi here with our weekly yoga philosophy share. If you're just jumping on for the first time this week, every Tuesday for this whole entire past year basically, I've been going live or posting a new video um, sharing a little tidbit about yoga philosophy with you. The way this course is designed is meant to be um, just nice small bite-sized chunks of learning about the basics, the foundation of yoga philosophy um, which are called the yamas and niyamas um, and this is perfect for anyone who is just interested in yoga philosophy maybe has never studied it before it's also going to be great for everyone who has maybe some uh, yoga background or possibly even a yoga teacher the amazing thing about Eastern philosophies in general and yoga philosophy specifically is that it is a circular philosophy so every time we're coming back to these concepts we're understanding them a little bit deeper um, and I am sharing from this book, The Yamas and Niyamas, Exploring Yoga's Ethical Practice by Deborah Adele. So we've just been going through reading the book together. If anyone out there is like me, I prefer to watch videos, listen to podcasts and audiobooks more so than actually read a book. I hardly ever have time to sit down and read a book, but I like to do lots of art and make necklaces and do things with my hands, so I love to listen to podcasts and audiobooks while I'm doing so, and that's the intention of creating this series. So if you're interested in previous videos from this series, we're actually almost to the end of the book. It's aligning up really divinely with um, the end of the year, so we'll be finishing the book together right about the end of this month, the end of December. Um, wow, it's the first of December, you guys. <laughs> Can you believe that? So today we're actually on the second to the last chapter of the book. All of the previous videos for all of the rest of the book before this point are going to be posted on my Facebook page, um, Live It to Yogini, join us on Patreon, and if you go to my profile there is a link for that page. There's also the playlist that is posted to my YouTube channel, so if you're a YouTube fan you can go and um, click subscribe to me and yeah, I'll be uploading this video to YouTube um, after we're done here today, and then you can go through the book and listen to any topic that feels good for you or maybe piques your interest. So basically the yamas and niyamas are considered as a basis for all of yoga philosophy. There are 10 central tenets, um, guidelines, for how we can live a righteous life, how we can live a life that will bring us closer and closer to inner peace. So the first five tenets are called the yamas. They could be translated into the actions to be restrained in order to cultivate inner peace. And then the last five tenets are the niyamas, or the actions to be cultivated in order to attain inner peace. So as I said, we are on the second to the last chapter today, which is on the topic of svadhyaya or self-study. This is one of my favorite niyamas. It's a niyama. So out of all of the ten tenets, this is one of my favorite ones because I really think that if um, we all start to cultivate the skills to look inside of ourselves and um, become more familiar and more emotionally intelligent and um, intelligent in general about our internal experiences, then we will have such a more effective time not only um, relating to ourselves and kind of processing our own experiences and um, trying to improve our behavior so that we can get a more desirable experience out of life and a desirable result out of you know our day-to-day -day life but once we do that self-reflection um, to once we learn more about ourselves and our own needs and the ways that we can improve then our external relationships and everything in the outside world will also greatly benefit from this and um, we'll see a lot more harmony and peace and just greater like flow and understanding with our relationships to other people, to money, to success and failure, um, to food, you name it. Once we find this more equanimous, peaceful relationship within ourselves, then that relationship will be reflected into the world. And to me, that's what Svadhyaya or self-study is all about. But don't take it from me. <laughs> Let's dive into the reading. And again, this is the book that we're reading. It's by Deborah Adele. I really like the way that she frames these concepts because they're very friendly to the Western mind. 
When my older brother and I were in grade school, we decided that our dad got cheated every Christmas by not receiving appropriate gifts for the love we felt for him. We decided to do something about that, and so for a year we saved all of our babysitting money and gift money until it was nearing Christmas. Then we had mom drop us off at a jewelry store where we proceeded to buy my dad the most beautiful diamond ring we could afford. We were delighted with ourselves. When we got home, we decided such a, such a gift needed to be wrapped in a special way, and so we set about gathering several boxes seven to be exact, and wrapping the diamond ring in its original box, proceeded to place it in the next size box, and then the next, until only one huge box remained. We wrapped the last box and placed it under the tree so our dad could spend the necessary time wondering what was in the huge box for him. When Christmas arrived, my brother and I were beside ourselves with excitement. This was the day our dad would get his special gift that we had prepared for the whole year. He unwrapped the big box, only to find another box, and then another, and then another. Before too long, our dad had decided we were playing a practical joke on him and moved into good sport mode, pretending to be exacerbated and delighted all at once. By the time he got to the last box, he was sure there was nothing waiting, but he was wrong. I don't think my brother or I will ever forget the look on his face when he opened that beautiful, sparkling diamond ring purchased with the love of two adoring children. The yogis teach that we as human beings are packaged much like this diamond ring. We are at the core divine consciousness. Around this pure consciousness, we are packed in boxes of our experience, also known as the koshas in Sanskrit or the sheets. So around this pure consciousness, we are packed in boxes, layers of our experience, our conditioning and our belief systems. These boxes are things like how we identify ourselves, what we believe to be true, our preferences and dislikes, our fears and imagination. All of these boxes are informed by country, culture, gender, town, ancestors and family history, groups we belong to, and our personal experience. This packaging is portrayed in a story told in the East. It seems God had just created human beings. Realizing that he, with an asterisk, <laughs> and under the he it says in the East, God being is considered masculine while God acting is considered feminine. So magical, um, Shakti, feminine energy, and then the Shiva, the masculine energy. Just a side note, please keep in mind that in yoga philosophy, all of us have the masculine and the feminine energies present within us no matter what your gender if you identify with the gender or not we all are made up of these primal masculine and feminine energies okay so <laughs> realizing that god or the divine or nature whatever kind of word you want to use had made a terrible mistake in creating human beings god called a council of the elders to get some help when the elders were gathered, God reported, I have just created humans and now I don't know what I'm going to do. They will always be talking to me and wanting things from me and I won't ever get any rest. Upon hearing God's dilemma, the elders made several suggestions telling God he could hide on Mount Everest or the moon or deep in the earth. But God responded hopelessly to all of these suggestions saying, no, humans are resourceful. Eventually they'll find me there. Finally, one elder walked up to God and whispered something in his ear. Then God shouted in delight, That's it! I'll hide inside of each human. They'll never find me there. <laughs> we suffer, the yogis tell us, because we forget who we are. We think we are the boxes we are wrapped in, and, that we are, uh, and forget that we are really the divine hiding inside. Svadhyaya, or self-study, is about knowing our true identity as divine and understanding the boxes we are wrapped in. We can find clues about our boxes by watching our projections, by the process of tracing our reactions back to a belief, and by courageously looking at life as it is. This process of knowing ourselves and the boxes that adorn us creates a pathway to freedom. The ability to shift our identification from our ego self, our boxes, to the witness, and finally to our true identity as divinity itself is the jewel of self-study. So basically what she's talking about here is the concept of kosha theory or the sheaths. And so she makes the analogy of the diamond ring being wrapped in many different boxes. And um, 
The diamond ring, essentially, in this analogy, is our soul, the divine essence of nature, pure love energy that resides within each and every single human being. That's why the story is kind of funny, because God says, or, you know, divine essence says, they'll never find me inside of them. <laughs> That's the one place that they won't look, because how are we designed? Um, all of our senses are designed to move outward into the world so that we can interact with this beautiful experience that we get to enjoy, this 3D reality. And all the while, not realizing this amazing gift that we have inside of ourselves. So the layers or the sheaths, the koshas, um, which would be each of the different boxes represented in the analogy, um, it's the food sheath or the body, the physical body, and then our pranic or energy sheath, our breath, the life force energy that moves through this physical sorry, someone was calling me, um, connecting our physical and our energetic realms. And then we have the mental body, our emotional body. Then we have our intellectual body, the part of us that decides, I like that, I don't like that, this is good, that's bad, that's right and wrong, that's our intellectual body. And then we have our Anandamaya Kosha, our bliss body. And this would be the last, the smallest little box right before we get to the diamond ring is the um, Anandamaya Kosha or bliss body. So for this next section of the book, I have a note to get a piece of paper. Um, you all are looking at your screens, so feel free to um, just type in the chat or in the comment section um, any of your reflections, or if you want to keep your reflections private, please take this time to get your little notebook out. Um, uh, it's having us, it's inviting us to do an experiment now. So do this experiment without quick, without thinking. Quickly write. You guys ready? <laughs> Quickly write down the first five things that come to your mind that describe the world as you see it. All right? So without thinking, don't think about it. Quickly write down the first five things that come to your mind that describe the world as you see it. All right. You got your five? Again, feel free to put them in the, in the comments if you got them. Now, look at what you've written. Every comment that you've used to describe the world will tell you more about yourself than about the world. You have just written clues into how you structure your beliefs, yourself, and your life. Love, life, love, light, darkness, and water. Ooh, that's beautiful. So you have just written clues into how you structure your beliefs, yourself, and your life. Every comment you make about the world, about another person, about an event, about life, is a projection of yourself and a clue to your interior landscape. So how we perceive the world ourselves, then, um, sorry. I'm distracted because my roommate keeps calling me. How we perceive the world, these five words that we've written down, is going to tell us more about ourselves and our internal experience than um, about the world itself because everything is based on our internal perceptions, right? Peace, home, abundant, connected, and interwoven. Beautiful experience. Thank you. Thank you guys for sharing. Love that. Got some positive people on this live stream right now. <laughs> Okay, so the world is your autobiography. Let's return to the old Kung Fu reruns. Earlier in the book, she talks about this. So the series uh, Kung Fu. When Cain, fondly called Grasshopper by his master, is a small boy in the monastery, his master finds him watching fish in a small pond. The master asks Grasshopper, how many fish are there? Grasshopper replies, 12, master. Good, replies the master, and how many ponds are there? Somewhat confused by such a seemingly obvious question, Grasshopper responds, one, master. No, replies master, there are 12 ponds, 12 fish, 12 ponds. In the previous exercise, we could have asked a room full of 500 people to do the same experiment, and all the answers describing the world would be different because each person would have described pieces of their unique self. 500 people, 500 worlds. 
I love that, don't you guys? <laughs> so basically this theory is the idea that each of us have our own perception, our personal internal experience, our personal perception creates our reality. And so it could be said that even though we definitely share a reality, there's something that we all agree upon. There's also um, individual perceptions for each and every one of us because we're all having our own unique experience and that's valid too. So 500 people, 500 worlds. 12 fish, 12 ponds. The world and others simply reflect back to us what we are seeing, not what is there. It is as if wherever we look, there are only mirrors that show us pictures of ourselves. We cannot love or hate something about another person or the world unless it is, unless it is already inside of us first. I'll say that again. We cannot love or hate something about another person or the world unless it is already inside of us first. The world gives you what you want to see. You can experiment with this truth by changing your story about what you see. You will notice the world changes to fit the story you are telling. The Buddhists say that the universe dies when you do because you've created your own little world of reality. As you begin to steadfastly pay attention to what you are saying to yourself about the moment, the other person, yourself, and life, you will get clues about the boxes you have wrapped yourself in that create your own little universe. All of these utterances are projections of the parts of yourself you love, don't love, can't see, or can't yet accept. It's kind of a hard pill to swallow sometimes, you guys, but... I feel like that is one of the biggest messages that I've incarnated this time around to share. So everything that we see outside of ourselves and inside of ourselves, but particularly, perta particularly pertaining to the things we see outside of ourselves that we don't like or we don't agree with, it's pointing back to something within ourselves. That's what this concept of svadhyaya or self-study is all about. So you may think, oh, that coworker or that person, you know, my partner, my child isn't doing X, Y, and Z and so I'm upset or is doing X, Y, and Z and so I'm upset. And yes, that is valid on a level. There's also your... Uh, there's also the possibility where you can take total responsibility for that and internalize um, an opportunity to learn and grow from it and see, well, what is it within myself that this external event or person is bringing up that is challenging for me? And where's the opportunity for me to learn and grow through that and heal? Usually we don't notice our beliefs or conditioning unless there is some kind of disharmony present. In this time, we have the opportunity to trace whatever we are saying about the moment back to a belief which we are either consciously or unconsciously holding. Tracing any disharmony back to ourselves will help us unpack a box we have ourselves wrapped in. For instance, I come from a family of origin where we as siblings were not allowed to fight. Our family was about love and loving meant we never fought. I carried that belief system unconsciously into my adult years. For me, when I saw anyone fighting, I judged it as wrong and interpreted it, interpreted it as meaning there was no love. By watching my judgment about fighting, I could eventually trace it back to this childhood belief and begin to understand that some people show love for each other by fighting, and fighting wasn't necessarily wrong. I was able to understand that people have different ways of showing love and affection. I was able to learn a new aspect about love, rather than staying firmly packed in the belief that love meant no fighting. On a more recent occasion, I was at a retreat center where shoes were left at the door. On a break, I went to put my shoes on and they had disappeared. Shortly after, I saw another woman wearing them. I was not happy. I knew that I didn't really care if she wore my shoes, so I began to trace back what was disturbing me. I realized that I was mad because she hadn't politely asked to wear my shoes. In my childhood, it was mandatory to say please and thank you before you took something, and if you forgot, you were punished. It was interesting to me that I wasn't bothered that she wore my shoes, but I was upset that she hadn't done what was right, according to my belief system. In this incident, I was able to see the power of my unexamined beliefs. Our conditioning and formation of beliefs begins very early in childhood. Recently, I watched as a group of young children emerged out of school for recess. I heard one child yell, freedom at last. I chuckled, but couldn't help wondering how this child's belief would further develop and influence the rest of his life. 
<laughs> freedom at last from school. <laughs> I was that kid, anyone else? <laughs> we learn early to accept our family's way of doing things and to pattern ourselves after cultural norms. These early conditionings continue to form and move deep inside us, creating pieces of our identity. Add to that our interactions to our own life experiences and Sorry, add to that our reactions to our own life experiences and we become neatly wrapped in layers of packaging. When faced with any disharmony, our tendency is to blame what is outside of us and then justify what we are thinking or feeling. If we're courageous enough to trace the disharmony back to ourselves, we can begin to unpack our boxes and open up vast amounts of freedom that brings us closer to our true essence. Tracing it back begins to unpack belief systems of shoulds, musts, and wrongs and rights. Anthony DeMello calls these belief systems models of reality. He says, we are happy when people and things conform and unhappy when they don't to our belief systems. People and events don't disappoint us. Our models of reality do. It is my model of reality that determines my happiness or disappointments. It is as if we wrap ourselves in the boxes of our belief systems and conditioning, and then when something doesn't conform to our system, we fight with all our energy to justify our system rather than to unpack the box. Bam! Real talk. <laughs> Zimalo's message is that when we fight to keep our belief system, it is as pointless as if my dad had wanted to keep his Christmas present wrapped and never open it to see the gift waiting inside. There's a saying that it is extremely difficult, even impossible to argue with a person who is truly enlightened because an enlightened person will not have any attachments to their own personal belief systems or opinions because they don't have that ego or that um, intellectual self that says this is right and wrong, I agree with that and that's bad and all these people are bad and I'm on this side, you know? A truly enlightened person um, has their own inner authority, which is the divine essence that they follow. So they aren't um, attached to an opinion. They see it all as uh, being divine. So you can't argue with them because they just, they aren't attached enough to any point of view to argue. <laughs> like a gift waiting to be opened, every event that life presents to us is a present, is a precious opportunity. It is a present. <laughs> every gift that, um, Life, life presents to us is a pre precious opportunity to learn the truth about the boxes we have ourselves packaged in. And it is especially the people we can't stand and the interruptions that drive us crazy that hold the greatest potential for us. Anthony DeMello puts it like this, every time I am disturbed, there is something wrong with me. I am not prepared for what has come. I am out of tune with things. I am resisting something. If I can find out what that something is, it will open the way to spiritual advances. Ooh, so good. Am I right, you guys? This is only the first half of this chapter, so we'll finish the uh, second half next week. Stay tuned. Again, it's every Tuesday these videos are posted. Um, and then at the end of every chapter, she shares a few little reflection um, assignments to help you integrate what we have shared together this month, so I or this week, so I invite you to reflect on these first two um, exercises just this week, and then next week we'll finish out the chapter together, and we'll have two more reflection exercises. So the first one, 99% of what bothers you is about you. 99% of what bothers others has nothing to do with you. <laughs> it's all these projections, right, of our internal perceptions and our own belief systems. So this week, notice how you turn the above statement around, blaming others for your own problems and taking responsibility for others' problems. So when we're upset, our tendency is to say, oh, you know, it's Nancy, it's Bob, it's that person over there, you know, they made me mad. And when other people are upset, even though it really doesn't have anything to do with us, we still take it on like, oh my gosh, that person's mad at me, what did I do wrong, how can I, you know? And sometimes it's appropriate to do that, um, but sometimes, you know, most of the time people just have their own thing going on and, and we project it outside of ourselves. Everyone is guilty of it, right? That's why, going back to what I said at the beginning of the video, if everyone can cultivate this skill of self-reflection, then we can know 
uh, so much more effectively what it is that we need in order to have healthy and balanced relationships and interactions in the world. And yeah, the world would just be an easier place to live in if everyone um, had this skill. Um, so practice taking responsibility for yourself and let others be responsible for themselves. That's the first reflection. And then the next one, this week, notice what you project onto others. These projections are things you are unwilling or unable to acknowledge within yourself. The things that most bother you about other people are likely things that you have going on within yourself that you just haven't fully integrated or accepted and loved yet. But that's okay, we all have those things. Just give yourself a little extra love whenever you see that um, little angry monster. For example, when I, uh, one of my pet peeves is people being late and it's because I am late <laughs> and it feels like a waste of my time and energy to always be rushing and being late to things and you know, um, taking other people's time as well. So just making that, um, seeing that connection, you know, like I'm annoyed when I'm late because, or I'm annoyed when other people are late because I know what's going on within me when I'm late and I realize that's what's happening with them. Ideally, no one would ever be late, but when we understand, you know, why we get bothered by these certain things, we can all have more compassion and move forward in a way that's more effective. So remember, you can't notice something in another person if it is not already in you, both your pettiness and your magnificence. Grow into full responsibility for yourself. So thank you guys for sticking around until the end of the video. I love you all so much and I will see you next week for the next yoga philosophy share. Again, if you want to see all the videos in this series, they are posted on playlists on Facebook, on my business page, Love Tea Yogini, and they're also on YouTube. Um, and my YouTube channel name is Liberty Yogini, so you can go check that out and find the playlist. Um, thank you all. Oh, so great to have you guys. Love you. And if you're curious about more yoga philosophy and want to dive a little bit deeper in with me and my content in general, I do a ton of yoga philosophy stuff over on my Patreon. In addition to recipes, I do guided meditations and breath work and um, some priestessing things. I have an interview on there. I have chakra worksheet coloring pages um, for you guys to print out and enjoy. There's just so much goodness over there. So if you're interested in Patreon, it is patreon.com uh, slash yogini. And after I post this video, I will um, include the link to everything that I'm mentioning. And feel free to reach out to me, send me a message if you have any questions. And I'd love to hear your reflections and experience with this content. So, um, Love you guys. Have an amazing rest of your day. Peace.